Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers and the audience for sticking around. Some of this is going to be um, you're, uh, discussing how health information technology can play a part in population health management, which has been discussed at length here today. Um, I'll talk about the burden of, uh, of inflammatory bowel diseases at the population level and what are the key components of population health management and where can health IT actually play a part here. We'll go uh, take, take a deeper dive into chronic care models in the context of health information technology and then Dr. Cross is going to talk about remote monitoring and telehealth. Uh, so we've beaten this to death. The U.S. healthcare spending on IBD is close to about $7 billion. It's been increasingly over the last decade or two. Even to date, more than half of that uh, cost is through inpatient care, and only 5% is on pharmaceutical care. Those numbers are changing rapidly as more and more biologics are being used. But we need to make sure that we decrease the associated cost of inpatient care as the cost of biologics is increasing. Talking about specifically what are the costs of hospitalization-related care, this was a study that we did using the nationwide readmissions database, wherein we longitudinally tracked a patient for one year. And overall, patients with IBD are hospitalized about 0.6 days every month. So that translates into about six or seven days every year with monthly costs of about $1,300. But if you look at the top 10% of those patients, they're admitted about four days every month. That's a month and a half every year they spend in the hospital at cost of about $7,500 per month. Uh, these patients are hospitalized every two months, and these top 10% of patients account for about 40% of your inpatient care, and the top 20% account for about 60% of inpatient care. So if we can actually target um, our resources towards these patients, we can actually achieve uh, what we call population health management more effectively. What are the risk factors and determinants of high healthcare utilization? Again, can be divided into three aspects, as was alluded to earlier. Social determinants, patients with low disease-related knowledge, lower socioeconomic status, patients with psychiatric illnesses. Disease-related determinants, which is the burden of disease, what is the Le Mans index, what is the disease phenotype severity, what are the comorbid conditions, including obesity, older patients, and finally, treatment-related uh, determinants, using medications at the right time for the right patient, avoiding chronic use of uh, narcotics on corticosteroids, and again, low volume centers in several studies have been shown to uh, increase healthcare costs by uh, suboptimal care. <clears throat> so the concept, concept of population health management in IBD pertains to coordination of care at a macro level to improve outcomes and effectively manage clinical and financial risks of a defined group of individuals. And as was discussed earlier, the triple aim is to improve quality of care, improve population level health outcomes, and reduce healthcare costs. And health IT can play a big part in facilitating this. Epic is not evil. We can use it well. What are the steps that are involved? Uh, the first step is to identify the high-risk patient population as well as sources of variability in care. There are some patients who are well, who are low need, low cost, and the focus on these patients should be prevention and doing no harm. But these patients can move in and out to different health states. They can be transitioned into patients being at risk for complications, and eventually they evolve into patients with complications who end up being the high need, high cost patients, requiring hospitalizations and surgeries and contributing disproportionately to costs. The main sources of variability in care, in care is to focus on managing acute flares of disease activity, but at the same time recognizing the underlying disease severity to prevent disease-related complications this, however, needs to be in the proper context so we can minimize treatment-related risks. And the health IT, the role of health IT here is to identify these triggers of transition, to identify subpopulations that are most likely to benefit from coordinated care. The second step in population health management is this chronic care model for at-risk patients. And there are several components of a chronic care model, six main components. Um, the first two are community resources and patient self-management support. And this is where social media, online health communities play a big part, and I'll take a deeper dive into this. The next part is the health IT or the electronic medical records, which focus on clinical information systems and IT. How can we identify our at risk patients? How can we present the data in an easy to digest manner so we can target appropriately? And how can we incorporate point of care clinical decision support to make the right decision for each patient? And finally, the concept of healthcare or reorganization and delivery system redesign, which will go into the concept of telemedicine and IBD medical homes that Ray would be talking about. 
So here, the role of health IT would be to facilitate a shift from ambulatory care, from acute episodic reactive encounters to more a proactive effort, planned and individualized long-term care for patients. So I'll take a deeper dive into each of the key components of chronic care models. The first is online health communities and social media. And again, we, this is something that is occurring at a rapidly increasing pace. We see this every time in our patients. 80% of users look at healthcare information online. I'm sure that number now is close to 100%. Everybody looks at somebody else's testimony. All our patients talk about how somebody else had a bad experience with the medications. And everybody's using all of these information that is available. And within these online health communities, there are different persona who, which, who shape the thinking of patients. There's some uh, uh, people within these communities who are influential users, others are information providers, still others play a role, in, a role in emotional support providers. So the more we embrace these communities and the more we leverage it to our advantage in managing patients, it'll be very helpful. The role of mobile health applications in IBD for self-management support, and uh, Ashish Atreja is into the business of prescribing apps for patients, which I think is a brilliant idea. There can be multiple different apps looking at bathroom scouts, general purpose apps, IBD education, symptom tracking, or IBD management, and I would refer you to this review for more details on these apps and how we can use them in our practice. The concept of proactive care planning, the role of clinical information systems within this, and this is where the project sonar is, uh, is, in a, is a prime example of this, wherein the healthcare system was redesigned and the information was presented in a more palatable manner. This system organize patient and provider data to facilitate timely, effective, and efficient care. You are able to identify patients at highest risk of complications and healthcare needs. You reach out to those patients specifically and coordinate care accordingly. And the system also provides for automated timely updates on the status of these patients outside of the healthcare system. Uh, once we have these patients, how can we utilize the best available evidence, the best available guidelines uh, to provide optimal care to these patients, and this is where electronic medical record integrated clinical decision support systems can play a part. These can facilitate clinical care consistent with best available scientific evidence, which needs to be rapidly updated, like Dr. Rubin said, and should be sensitive to patients' values and preferences. It should be available at the point of care, integrated with EMRs, so that not only can you provide the best care to the patient, but also fulfill the needs of providing or demonstrating quality in the EMR when you write these notes. So a couple of examples of chronic care models within IBD. The first one is Project Sonar. This uh, is a joint venture between Illinois, uh, between Illinois Gastroenterology Group and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois. And what they identify is that over two-thirds of patients who are hospitalized with IBD have not had a physician interaction for the 30 days leading up to the actual hospitalization. And so they redesigned the system to minimize the risk of that. They proactively develop, utilize algorithms which are available, develop predictive analytics to identify who are the patients at highest risk, assess and categorize patients at risk, engage them outside of the clinic by sending them monthly pings to see how these patients are doing, and using standardized disease, disease activity indices, identified who are the patients who are getting worse without really understanding why they're getting worse, or have a clinic visit that is three months out, and they proactively reached out to these patients to uh, manage their care. And the results are self-evident. So the key components from a chronic care model standpoint for Project Zone are, are patient engagement and self-management support, monthly ping sent out to patient, assessment of patient reported outcomes. They utilize clinical information systems very nicely by, by integrating patient data with EMR data, enhance visualization to facilitate proactive care planning, They've integrated the AGA clinical care pathways into clinical decision support tools, which can be utilized at point of care. And they've redesigned their system so that cl clinic visits can be performed early for those patients whose disease activity indices are getting worse. And they've demonstrated tremendous success. Um, still, just within uh, 10 months of in, in, uh, starting this, 50% decline in hospitalization, 11% decline in healthcare costs. And this has translated into an alternative payment model of cost savings and sharing with Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Another example of a chronic care model is IBD Chorus, which is an IBD learning health system, about 30 sites, both community and academic participating, to engage 20,000 patients with repeat PDSA cycles for iterative learning and improving the quality of care. The key components of this are a, 
a dedicated health IT platform which both patients and providers can use as a dashboard to follow along patients, incorporation of clinical decision support tools, a goal to design to redesign the delivery system and providing self-management support by patients being able to record their symptoms and being engaged in their uh, care. So in conclusion, I we know that a small fraction of patients contribute disproportionately to healthcare utilization in IBD, and effective population health management strategies can improve the quality of care and reduce costs. And health information technology and online health communities, social media, can play a part by getting patients more engaged and successfully implementing this multidimensional chronic care model to improve population health. I'll move on to the next part on remote monitoring and telehealth, which is the key part where we have made most advances. So I, I don't have any relevant financial disclosures for this, but I, I do have a key disclosure that even though I'm a, an advocate for telehealth, I have to admit that if any of you asked me for help with your computers, I would be completely useless. So as far as the bells and whistles behind this, behind this technology, that's not really my strong suit. So uh, traditional monitoring of patients with IBD has included scheduled follow-up visits or visit it, visits as needed. Uh, this is an interesting study that looked at the average time of an office visit, which included travel and wait times in the clinic. And the average office visit in the United States takes about two hours. So that's the kind of time that our patients are putting in to see providers. In between office visits, often telephone contacts, David Binion has highlighted the burden of telephone calls in patients with IBD. What are the problems with traditional monitoring? One is access to a nurse and physician, and this could be access because you live in a remote area and you don't have an IBD specialist. It could be because you don't have resources to get to the provider. It could be that the provider and the nurse are not available. So those are all big problems which can lead to delays in scheduling follow-up or testing and in initiating treatment plans. This is from a, a clinical gastro hep article that Susie Kane and I wrote that highlights the different aspects of telehealth. The first panel, panel A, is telemonitoring. This can include uh, web-based technology using your cell phone or your computer. It can also include text messaging. So this is where we're pinging patients about their symptoms. They report outcomes, and then they either get algorithmic-driven responses to self-manage their condition or it alerts the team to the problems that they're having so that we can intervene. Panel B in the middle is a classic telehealth visit. This is provider in office, patient in home. You're conducting a visit just as you would in the office, but you're doing it virtually. And then panel C is the Medicare model where patients in certain zip codes, like rural zip codes, would go to a local provider's office where they would then interact with a remote provider at a, a distant site. What are the reasons for increased use of telemedicine in 2017? Well, this is an old study from 2013. It's almost universal now that patients have access to a computer or cell phone. It's estimated that over 90% have access to a cell phone. Uh, it's pretty clear that outcomes in chronic illness care are suboptimal, so we need to do better. And patients, especially younger patients, are seeking more efficient and convenient ways to receive their medical care. So now I'm going to show you a number of studies that have, have looked at either telemonitoring or telehealth. This was a study from the Veterans Affairs, a small study, randomized controlled trial of 34 veterans. So what they did in this study is that patients of the Palo Alto VA either received a standard encounter or they received a telehealth encounter. So the fellow in the Palo Alto VA would have assessed a veteran. They would then go to the conference room and they would remote with a specialist at the San Francisco VA. They would come up with a management plan and they also had access to imaging and PATH via telehealth. They would then go back into the room with the veteran and they would have a three-way conversation with the fellow and veteran in the room and the remote specialist at the San Francisco VA. Uh, when they looked at these two groups of patients, both groups rated their experience as excellent. Uh, the total clinic duration uh, in each encounter was approximately an hour. Wait time and median number of patients per clinic session, four to five, were similar. So that's, that's good. Um, I can tell you that my chief, my administrator, Tom Ullman, is not going to be happy seeing four to five patients per clinic session. So um, just proof of concept that this can be done and that patients are very receptive. 
This was a telemonitoring study from Denmark and Ireland, 333 patients. It was a one-year randomized controlled trial in patients with mild to moderate UC. This was a web-based technology called Constant Care. So after randomization, patients that were enrolled in Constant Care received a three-hour educational training session, which was both about using the website as well as disease state awareness. When patients were well, they did monthly monitoring um, through the web system, but when they were flaring, they had daily monitoring until they entered the green zone. So this traffic light system with green light when you're well, red light when you're really sick, you're gonna also see with some of the studies that we've done at Maryland. Once they enter the green zone, they do weekly assessments and then they go back to monthly. And primarily patients were managed here with oral or topical 5 ASAs, although there was a subgroup that received treatment with steroids. Importantly, the web group here did not receive standard care. All of their health was delivered through the web system unless they needed a quick sick visit. So these are the results. So the first bullet here is very important. Only 41% of the patients completed the study, and the early telemedicine trials are all plagued by a very high attrition rate. In the Danish arm, the web group was more adherent to acute treatment, but there was overall no difference in adherence in the Danish arm. The web group uh, did have a greater improvement in knowledge and quality of life. The flare rates were not different, but they were shorter in the web group. The Irish arm had similar findings, except that their relapse rate was actually higher. Now this last bullet is actually quite important. Uh, there was decreased healthcare utilization. There was less acute care and routine visits in the web care group, but unreimbursed care, so emails and telephone calls was significantly incre increased in the constant care group. This is the system from UCLA, which is also a monitoring system. Um, it's called EIBD, and it utilizes a cell phone, tablet, or computer. So they initially studied whether patient self-assessment using this system was as accurate as in-person, in-clinic assessments, and in fact it was. They were quite, patients are quite accurate at self-assessing their symptoms. And what they did here is they basically organized care in a different pathway. So imagine you're starting a patient on azathioprine, you're gonna do labs at set intervals, you're gonna do visits at set intervals. What EIBD did is they integrated these self-assessments in replace of some of the routine care visits. Patients could also access various support programs, which I've listed here. And then they basically looked at UCLA patients compared to outside of the UCLA network assuming that EIBD represented um, this difference or change, and they found that UCLA patients were less likely to use steroids and had fewer ER visits and hospitalizations. It was already mentioned that Shisha Trija also is using a self-monitoring system called Health Promise. This is an app that he's developed, and it uh, links patient-reported outcomes into the medical record for decision support. Uh, providers can view, uh, review the results and uh, take action, and this is being evaluated as part of a pragmatic, multi-center, randomized controlled trial. The biggest study to date is called My IBD Coach. It was a randomized controlled trial from two academic centers and two non-academic centers in the Netherlands. Uh, almost 500 patients in the MyIBD Coach group and 444 in the standard care arm. Again, MyIBD Coach was replacing standard care, um, and they found they would register their disease activity on this profile, on this program, and then the providers would uh, take action. And you can see MyIBD Coach in the middle and standard care on the right. Outpatient visits were significantly decreased by almost one visit per year in the MyIBD Coach group. Hospital admissions were cut by 50%, uh, and quality of care scores between the two arms were equivalent. There was no difference in flares, steroid courses, and surgeries between groups. So at, the, at a minimum, what this tells you is you can replace some of your care uh, with electronic monitoring, with decreased healthcare utilization, and perhaps equal outcomes. So the, the last um, group of, last study I'm going to talk about is our tele-IBD trial that was uh, University of Maryland, Vanderbilt, and University of Pittsburgh. This was a text messaging based system, so patients either weekly or every other week received a series of text messages to assess their symptoms. 
their body weight, side effects to therapy. We also provided educational messages and medication prompts. Patients received automated responses based on their uh, reporting of symptoms as well as an assessment of where they were, whether they were in the green, yellow, or red zone. The nurse coordinators at the various sites also received an alert if a patient was in the yellow or red zone. So we recruited 348 patients amongst the three sites. We had uh, almost 75% of patients complete the final 12-month visit, which was quite good uh, for a telemedicine trial. And our withdrawal rate in the one-year trial was only 14%, although it was higher in the two telemedicine arms. This is looking at Harvey Bradshaw index scores in the, in the patients with Crohn's disease at baseline. And so this is a nice advertisement for Maryland, Pitt, and Vanderbilt. All of our patients got better on average, but you can see that the tele-IBD arms, which are in the dashed lines here, there's not, a real, there's not a significant difference compared to the control when you look at change and when we did adjustments. Similarly, looking at um, SCCAI scores and ulcerative colitis, all the patients improved, but there was no difference in the telemedicine group. And looking at quality of life, we're looking at the inverse, quality of life went up in all three arms, and this was not significant between the groups. So the last data slide here is gonna be very hard to read. We also looked at healthcare utilization from extraction of data from the electronic records at the three sites. There's three main take home messages here. In the first line, if you can make it out, healthcare encounter, um, encounters, total encounters increased significantly from baseline in all three groups. So we used a lot of resources to manage these patients. This was primarily driven by office visits, infusions, and electronic encounters, emails, or I'm sorry, telephone encounters. The second message here is that, remember I told you emails and telephone calls was increased with the prior systems? Actually, in our study, we didn't find that. Although they did increase in the groups, there wasn't a significant difference between telemedicine and standard care and the unreimbursed care. And lastly, I've highlighted this in red, you can look at IBD-related hospitalizations. So despite total encounters going up at all three sites, we did see a decline in IBD-related hospitalizations. It actually went up slightly in the standard care group, but you can see in the telemedicine arms, there was a significant decline in IBD-related hospitalizations. Now quickly, I'm gonna summarize our telehealth program at Maryland. Corey Siegel's also doing this at Dartmouth with very similar results. We initiated this program and, yep. So we initiated this in 2015. These are, our, these are some screenshots. The take home message here is go to the next to last bullet. Uh, over 50% of patients said that it, the telehealth visit saved them one to three hours and 40% said that it saved them over three hours. And uh, satisfaction with this technology was quite good. Thank you very much.